Hello, this is Dr. Todd Grande. Welcome to my video on factor analysis. I have here a data set, an SPSS. It's a uh, fictitious data set. And I'm going to use it to uh, show you how to run a factor analysis and interpret the results. So let's start by taking a look at the data. Uh, in this data set, we have uh, a variable named ID. Uh, labeled ID, and there's 100 uh, cases. So this is this represents 100 participants who took an assessment, and the assessment had 10 items on it. And let's just say that this assessment was designed to measure two constructs: uh, one, depression, and items one through five were designed to uh, assess depressive symptoms, and the other anxiety, and that would be items 6 through 10, uh, were designed to measure anxiety. What we use factor analysis for is to see if, uh, among other things, if that is true. If these items load together in a way where items 1 through 5 group together, or uh, and or items 6 through 10 group together. That is, do those items have factor loadings which indicate that uh, they stick together, they represent, uh, uh, they load on the same construct. Now you could also run a factor analysis without having any uh, idea uh, formed in advance about how the items are going to divide up. You may, you may have some different hypotheses about how they're going to load and if they're going to load together or not and what ways they'll load together but you may not know um, you may have not have designed the instrument uh, with a specific um, factor loading model in mind so it's more just exploratory you want to see if the constructs or if the items load together on a particular constructs but for the purposes of uh, this demonstration let's assume that we design this instrument to capture those two distinct constructs, uh, depression and anxiety. So we would, we would hope to see uh, that items 1 through 5 load together and items 6 through 10 load together. So let's start by um, uh, clicking Analyze. We'll go to Dimension Reduction and Factor. And you can see that, so let me put these uh, back where they were. You can see that you have variables here. You have ID and then the 10 items. Right, so what you do uh, is just select all and then deselect ID and then move them all over into the variables. So in a factor analysis, all the uh, responses, all the individual uh, values for the different items are actually entered uh, into this, actually loaded into this variables list box. Right, so to go back for a second, these these items are actual scores. Uh, so this, this item is, might be a, a question related to um, sleep patterns, which have been tied to depression. This item might be an item that asks about um, not having enjoyment in, in uh, activities that once provide enjoyment, right? and other criteria for depression. So these are actual individual items or questions on an assessment. Right, so you have to record them in this way in order to run a factor analysis. So moving back to um, dimension reduction and factor. So you would have all these different items in the variables list box. For descriptives, uh, you're going to want the initial solution, uh, coefficients, uh, significant levels, the determinant, and uh, KMO and Bartlett's test of sphericity. All right, and continue. Uh, for the ex uh, extraction, by default, uh, the unrotated factor solution uh, comes up. You also want the scree plot. And I left this to the default based on the eigenvalue of greater than 1. So this is how it decides how many factors to extract. Right? So a factor is extracted if its eigenvalue exceeds 1. Now the rotation... Um, there's a couple different types of uh, 
rotations, actually several types of rotations. Uh, but there's two general categories, right? And one is when you believe that the uh, constructs are unrelated to one another, uh, so not correlated with one another, and one where you believe that they are correlated. And there's a lot of different views on what type of rotation to use, and of course it affects uh, your results. But in the social sciences uh, and counseling, for example, it's hard to imagine a data set where uh, you would have uncorrelated items, right? We know that uh, in, in this particular instrument, we believe that the, the uh, depression-related items are going to be correlated to one another, and we believe the anxiety-related anxiety items are going to be correlated to one another, but also uh, those two groups of items, right, So uh, are going to be correlated to each other. So, for example, you know, item 7 uh, still might be related to item 4, even though they load on different constructs. So in, in social sciences, uh, we tend to use, um, or well, I tend to use oblique rotations. And I chose the uh, direct. Uh, if you believe they're uncorrelated, uh, there's, a different, uh, there's a different set of uh, options, uh, which we refer to as uh, orthogonal. Right, so that would be Veramax, Quartermax, Equimax. And orthogonal uh, means unrelated. So this is so it's easy to remember in that way. It's orthogonal if you believe that they're not correlated, and it's oblique if you believe uh, that they are correlated. So I selected the direct, and uh, I want the uh, rotated solution to be displayed. Uh, scores, I did not. Uh, endorse any of the options here, but you can save the scores uh, as separate variables. And then for options, I left excluding cases list-wise, which of course in this uh, demonstration, no cases will be excluded because all the data uh, is populated. So then at this point, um, you hit OK, and you first see uh, the correlation matrix. Uh, so remembering uh, our initial hypothesis about what we would find here. Uh, if you look at this matrix, clearly item 1 is going to correlate perfectly with item 1. Uh, but we're looking for uh, correlations between uh, these different items. So item 2, 0.128 with item 1, uh, item 4, 0.338, so uh, much stronger uh, correlation with item 1. And similarly, if we look at item 6, uh, you can see um, item 6, the correlation with item 7, um, quite strong, 0. Uh, 0.542. And um, item 8 and item 6, 0. 0.635. But the other uh, correlations are fairly weak, meaning the ones that uh, between uh, depression and anxiety. So item 3, uh, correlating with item 7, for example, is fairly weak, but not in every instance. See, item 3 here correlates fairly strongly, um, well, moderately with, with uh, item 8. So what we're really looking for here um, is a few things. We want to make sure that uh, the items uh, are correlated. like we, It gives us an idea of what's going on. Uh, but we're really looking at the determinant, right? And the determinant value here is uh, 0 0.044. This is one of the... Uh, variables we're looking at. It has to be greater than 0 0.00001. So we're, we're fairly safe here with a determinant of 0 0.044. Uh, if it was below uh, 0 0.00001, then the items are too unrelated. Uh, the, the correlation is too low. Another area we want to look out for is correlations that are too high, what's called multicollinearity. Right, when two items are really, uh, the, the shared variance is too high, they're explaining the same thing, uh, that's, that's not helpful either. And the, the cutoff uh, for um, considering uh, an item multicollinear in a factor analysis, one cutoff that's popular is uh, 0.8, a correlation of 0.8. And you can see that none of the values here in our correlation matrix exceed 0.8. 
uh, if you have a perfect correlation outside of the uh, you know, obvious you know, item one perfectly correlated item one, item two perfectly correlated item two, if you have a uh, perfect correlation, that's called singularity. Uh, and, and obviously, uh, in either one of those circumstances, uh, that presents a problem, either multicollinear or if there's a singularity, and you're, you're going to want to remove that item from the analysis. So a correlation of greater than 0.8, uh, you're going to want to remove um, and change around items to uh, eliminate that item, or one of the items, in that mix uh, that's, that's uh, resulting in that high correlation. Looking at uh, KMO and Bartlett's test, uh, you want this. We have a value here of, of uh, for uh, KMO of 0.764. Anything above 0.5 is okay. Obviously, the, the greater the value here, the better. Um, similarly, with uh, Bartlett's test of sphericity, you want uh, you want statistical significance, and we certainly have it here. Right, you can see it's 0 0.000, which uh, usually for writing up uh, APA style papers. I record this as uh, 0 0.001, right? So uh, a value less than 0 0.001 uh, p-value. So you can see that the uh, looking at the extraction here. Uh, let me let me move down. I'll come back up to the variance. Explain. You can see that there's two uh, components that were extracted based on the eigenvalue of greater than one. This is the eigenvalue of greater than one. This is the scree plot here. You can see you have one, two, but this third uh, potential factor didn't meet the cutoff. So these two components, moving back up to total variance explained, explain 52% of the variance. All right. So not ideal. Uh, certainly a larger number here would be, would be better, but um, still you can see from the screen plot they are above the eigenvalue of one. Now, since we used an, uh, uh, an oblique rotation, uh, the direct, uh, we're going to want to interpret the pattern matrix. All right? It's not a whole lot different than the component matrix or the structure matrix, but this is the one we're going to want to look at uh, with this particular rotation. And you can see, let's start with component two. You can see these values load together uh, fairly tightly. Right? These, these seem to represent one construct as you look here. There's not a lot of variance here. Similarly, uh, we believe that items six and 10 represent uh, a construct. In, in, in the case I have here, it was supposed to be uh, anxiety. right? And you can see, again, these load together fairly tightly. So if you look at this uh, pattern matrix, there does seem to be two distinct factors. Two distinct factors. So uh, that's how you uh, run a factor analysis and interprets the results. Uh, as a um, reminder, I ran a, um, if you look back at going through the analysis, um, menu selection, what was drawn here it is. Uh, technically the method was principal components and uh, there is a, a little bit of a difference between principal components analysis and factor analysis but oftentimes uh, these uh, terms are used interchangeably. But I just want to let you know that they are a little bit different uh, and if you want more information on that certainly um, I would encourage you to uh, explore that further. Uh, but generally, uh, we accept the principal components analysis uh, as achieving the same goal as the factor analysis, and we, we tend to use the terms interchangeably. Uh, there are many methods, as you can see here, though, uh, for uh, this, this particular factor analysis uh, extraction. So I hope this uh, video was helpful and uh, allowed you to learn uh, a little bit more about factor analysis. As always, if you have any questions or concerns, feel free to contact me and I will be happy to assist you.